It's Typewriter Tuesday. Let's journey into the past to see what writers of old used to use to ply their trade. What kind of mechanical beauty does Al have for us this week? Hi, Alton Gansky here again, and welcome to Typewriter Tuesday. Today, we're going all the way back in time to 1925, over 90 years ago, uh, to look at what I think is one of the most beautiful typewriters made, and they did many variations of this, uh, this Corona number four. I'll tell you why it's called a four in just a minute, but it's a fabulous little piece, very Art Deco, very open. Art Deco, uh, you see in the styling, uh, Art Deco was a kind of art form that celebrated the industrial age, so a lot of things were made out of metal, um, showed machines, uh, there were other things that uh, define what Art Deco was, especially as far as human form and the like. But in the 20s and into the 30s, Art Deco was very big, and that's also true for many of the typewriters uh, from that time. So we get these wonderfully smooth lines, uh, great little caps on top of the uh, covers, on top of the spools for the ribbon. And inside the ribbon spools uh, are wonderful covers for them. Let me see if I can get one off, and you can see that there with the little circles, very industrial, uh, very nice uh, in that sense, and very useful. Now today we've gotten used to typewriters looking a certain way, but in the early days uh, they were going through times of transition. So if you go back and look at some of the earlier episodes of Typewriter Tuesday, you'll find one that has to do with a Corona uh, 3. And the first thing you'll notice and the difference is that it only has three banks. Banks is the proper term for what we normally call rows uh, that the keys are in. But it had only three banks, Corona 3. And then later in 1925, they came out with the Corona 4. And you guessed it, one, two, three, four, there's four banks. And that would go on to become the standard in most typewriters. Uh, there were other groups doing this. And they were always experimenting with uh, things. But this became one of the most beautiful ones, and you could get it in various colors. Uh, I think at least two other colors, if memory serves. And then sometimes they, uh, in later models, they began to uh, put other decoration on the, the side to make it even uh, snazzier, dress it up for uh, a night on the town. You can see it's very compact, yet it's uh, not as compact as some of the earlier portables. We have two knobs, both Remington and uh, Corona often left the knob off so it would fit in the case a little bit better. Um, but also because Art Deco loves to celebrate the mechanical and the industrial, you'll notice that nothing's covering the top. So in essence, it's a topless typewriter. Uh, you can see the, uh, how the mechanism works. You can see all the keys coming up. Usually the type basket, called the type basket because, well, it looks like a basket. Um, and it's made with the, the type bars. So uh, you can see all the stuff that goes on, and that was kind of celebrated during that time. Uh, all the way around, very slick, very, very dark, uh, enameled black. Uh, I even had trouble with the lighting on this, so you could see um, the white keys, which tend to get overexposed, and then the black, which is underexposed. So I set up a whole bunch of different lights. A lot of the controls you expect to find on uh, a portable typewriter like this, you can release uh, the paper, that is the rollers that hold the paper there. You can see the margins are very easy to get to. Um, no tab on this one. Uh, it was not a tab-ready typewriter. You'll see more and more of that uh, in uh, later years as we move along. And also, uh, no number one, our exclamation mark. Again, not unusual for the period. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to show you this is not only it, is it the next model from the Model 3 that we did uh, many weeks back, uh, but also because uh, I'm often asked, and anybody who collects typewriters uh, hears this question, why do you collect typewriters? Uh, for me, the joke has always been it's cheaper than collecting cars, uh, which is certainly true, uh, but there is, for some of us, especially writers, uh, who love to collect things the way it used to be done. So people used to use typewriters all the time, and when I was growing up, that was the way uh, to communicate I was with a uh, with the typewriter. Uh, but another reason that some of us collect typewriters is because they're tied to history in some way or another. So when I first started gathering these little babies up, 
uh, wherever I could. Uh, I began by uh, first just getting a typewriter, which my wife actually bought for me, a Royal KMG. G means gray. Uh, we have an episode on the KMM, which is black, but it's essentially the same machine. Uh, and you can see that in one of the earlier uh, shows. Uh, but then I began to collect things that related to me. So, for example, I found a little portable called the Royal Eldorado. Also did an episode on that. But that's what I used in high school and college. And then I found uh, an Underwood uh, 5, which is what I learned on in junior high school. Yeah, they were making that sort of typing in junior high school in San Diego. Um, but so I collected those because they meant something to me. But also I've noticed as I began to expand my collection, as I learned more, that uh, these can also represent certain eras in history. And 1925 was rather pivotal in uh, U.S. history and in many ways uh, throughout the world. We've come out of World War I where uh, small towns, big cities are trying to get back into the swing of things. People are trying to get their life back. But in 1925, something happened. There was a court case made famous by a movie called Inherit the Wind. Don't base your opinion on the trial on that movie. They took a lot of liberties with it, though it's a very well-acted and well-directed movie. But the Scopes Monkey Trial, as it's often called, changed everything. And that trial, although it was a misdemeanor, no jail time, none of that, there would be uh, maybe a fine if Scopes lost, which uh, he did, John T. Scopes, uh, but the, it was appealed and the fine for, I think it was 100 bucks, was thrown out. And... Um, in a, in a second trial, but nonetheless, he did not win uh, his cause, which was really uh, a group of people who had asked him to be the sacrificial teacher uh, to uh, battle what was known then as the Butler Bill, which is you couldn't teach anything contrary to what was taught on the book of Genesis. Anyway, all of that to simply say this, it became what was known as the trial of the century, even though it was really a minor thing in a small town in Tennessee, but it was the first trial in the United States to be broadcast over radio throughout the country. And uh, it became such a big event with uh, William Jennings Bryant, who was just part of the prosecution team. He was really there to deliver, deliver the closing address because he hadn't practiced law in 30 years. And what he could do was deliver speeches because he had run for president three times. He was an orator. And uh, he was the youngest man to run for president in 1896. He ran a few other times, never won became Secretary of State of the United States under uh, Woodrow Wilson and so on. Well, at this time, he's an, an elderly man, especially for 1925. He's 65. Clarence Darrow, who just did not like him anymore. They used to get along, but found out he was going to be there, so he volunteered his services. The only time, by the way, he ever uh, worked for nothing, uh, so that he could face off against Bryant. And it became something greater than what the trial had been set up for. Okay, now to my point and why I'm talking about this on Typewriter Tuesday uh, and its historical significance is the trial became so popular that over 200 reporters filled a very small uh, courtroom and they would begin to file upwards to 135,000 words every day about what was going on in this trial that took less than two weeks. Uh, 135 words, if you're not a writer, that may not mean much to you. But a, a good-sized novel is about 100,000 words. That's what a typical novel is. Some run more, some run less. Uh, but 100,000 words is going to be 350 pages if you set it up for a novel. So that means every day uh, these reporters were filing enough words to make a novel. Before it was all said and done, uh, one historian said that you could compile all the writings that had been done during that time on the trial into 3,000 books of 300 pages each. Now, what that means is somebody's out there typing on something. And since this is 1925, the same year, there's a good chance there are at least a few reporters there that had this version of the Corona or some other typewriter or maybe an earlier version of Corona. Corona 3 they made for quite a while, even after this one came out, to file their uh, reports and uh, their, their articles. So it's interesting to me that something like this, which was never really designed to be uh, part of a historical event, uh, comes into play in a, uh, an amazing historical trial. Whether you like the outcome or not, that's immaterial. The point is that's what happened, and there were people pounding away on keys just like this to file those reports. So sometimes we collect typewriters because of historical significance. 
That doesn't mean the model that you collect, if you go buy one of these, for example, doesn't mean it has to be uh, in the courtroom of the 1925 Scopes trial or uh, used overseas by reporters during World War II. It just simply means that this model represents a period of time. And it could represent Art Deco, it could represent post-World War I, uh, pre-World War II times. They just mean something. And that means that someone in 1925 owned this thing and they were probably very aware of what was going on. Now this particular typewriter, very clean. The platen has not been replaced, but it's not very grooved. There's no wear marks down here. When you're collecting typewriters, you look for those. The wear marks never bother me. It means that it's a real typewriter, been used by real people to do real things. So I don't care if there's wear marks on it, but this one does not have uh, very many wear marks. Uh, overall, it is pretty clean. It needs more cleaning because you know it's over 90 years old. And uh, so I've started on it, but it needs a little more love. Again, it has all the things you want in a typewriter, as well as some panache of design. It is capable of using a bichrome ribbon. This one is just a solid black. But this little device over here, let me lift this up so you can see it. You can see a little bit of red over here on this. This changes the ribbon uh, from uh, the key uh, bar striking the top of the ribbon or the bottom of the ribbon. So you can use a, a bichrome, a two-color uh, ribbon in this. It does have a paper bail, uh, still relatively new for many typewriters of that age, uh, but some of them were around, so not all that rare. A uh, mechanism is the kind of mechanism that's going to be used for decades to come, uh, and it's a slick little typewriter. It does a pretty good job. It has the elite type, and again, one of the ways you see that is you look at the uh, markings on the inside on the scales. You can see down in here and up in here, it goes past 90. Uh, that's characters with that. So in other words, you're getting 12 characters per inch. The larger type is 10 and sometimes called pica. But uh, it's just one of the differences. So you're going to get more words on the page, though they do appear a little tiny. And that also means they catch more ink. And if they get clogged up with ink, uh, the, it, the print doesn't look quite as clean. Uh, so you have to clean the, uh, the slugs, uh, the type bars uh, from time to time. It's not difficult to do, it just needs to be done uh, on occasion. Just like every once in a while you got to put a drop of oil or two in a few key places to keep the thing running properly. But never too much oil, that will ruin a typewriter. Um, and most of the time you don't even have to add oil. But as they get older, occasionally there's friction points that need to be touched on. Well, all righty. So that's probably more history lesson than typewriter lesson. And, but it's still, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and the idea that, to think that sometimes we collect typewriters um, that could have been used, at least that model could have been used in uh, key events. And this from 1925, when I think of 1925, I think of the Scopes trial, and um, which I had done some research on and used in one of my books. So uh, that's kind of near and dear to my heart. 1925, Corona 4, 4 because 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 banks on the typewriter, and a wonderful piece of machinery. I'm Alton Gansky, altongansky.com, and um, thank you for joining me on Typewriter Tuesday. Be sure to uh, give us a thumbs up or subscribe uh, to the, my page at the website or the channel on YouTube if you want to go there, subscribe, and you'll get notifications every time. Um, I put up a typewriter Tuesday. Once again, Al Gansky saying goodbye for now.